Well, I know many of you are wild with anticipation for part two of expansion and non-extraction. In the first part, you will recall that I talked about the lower arch being the diagnostic arch. Yes, well, I talked about the suture or lack of it in the mandible, right? And I talked about uprighting lower canines. So if the lower canines are angled lingually, upright, uprighting them, I don't think that anybody takes issue with that. But translating them or bodily expansion. Now, let's see someone do that and prove they did it and that it stayed reasonably stable. And of course, I mentioned about the fragile periodontal structures that could be on the facial, all of that, but I know you you can't stand to wait any longer. Let's see about expansion and non-extraction. Here we go. What I've done here is I have taken an arch blank out of a box and you need to remember that this is where I need the expansion. This is where I need to gain arch length, right here. So as I expand aggressively in the posterior, do you see any arch length gain in the anterior that's going to help me? Because I really don't. Again, the canine's uh, limitation of expansion beyond the bye 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 upright position. If you would like to take a look at this article, here is the reference where um, the authors pointed out that molar expansion was the least effective in arch length gain, and incisor advancement was the most effective, advancing incisors, holding E space, backing up lower molars. If one knows how to do that mechanically, of course, that would tend to make the patient more class two, a story for another time. In fact, incisor advancement was four times better than expansion in gaining arch length, and it would take five millimeters of expansion in the posterior to gain less than two millimeters in the anterior region. Here, what you're looking at here, if you'll follow the red laser dot, more than five millimeters of expansion versus two millimeters of incisor advancement, that's that quote, approximately two and a half millimeters of canine expansion is necessary to achieve the same increase in arch perimeter. So again, the uh, advantage is anterior posterior movement, advancing lower incisors, holding E space, distalizing lower molars if you know how to do that mechanically, stopping the lower incisors from their normal migration lingually during growth. Um, that's another thought. Uh, the, the appropriate use of a lower lingual arch at the right time. Again, a story for another time. Our criteria for expansion, which well, I will go over in more detail in another presentation for you, uh, comes from Lyle Johnston and his uh, postgraduate students. Absolutely outstanding research. Uh, that would be Lapana Pornlap and Johnston, Paquette Beatty and Johnston. Uh, these research um, endeavors that they did quite a while ago, the description of extraction was upper and lower incisor protrusion in other words, the incisors are forward. Um, lower incisor crowding or irregularity, and of course, soft tissue profile protrusion. Those were the criteria. Many of us have been highly influenced by Lyle Johnston's outstanding clinical research, and this is one of Professor Johnston's sayings. What can be achieved is limited by the choice of treatment. Uh, not all treatments end up with the same end result. Now, maybe that's an obvious statement, but it seems that, um, that this is also taken over that many, many clinicians, whether they're orthodontists or not, their intent is to do essentially the same thing on everybody, sometimes at the same time. Well, if the, I don't take out teeth, that's not what I do. And you can find that in, the, um, in advertisements, maybe not so much in literature, uh, scientific literature, but in advertisements. Well, if that is the clinician's intention, then why even diagnose the case? Why not just slap the braces on and do the treatment? Well, another common thing is if you use my technique, if you use my technique, hmm, that might be just a little uh, financially motivated, then things will work out for you if you use my technique in my hands and then they show uh, cases. And of course, they only show cases that agree with them, but these things are not published in refereed literature. 
These are case reports. They are not following the scientific method. The burden of proof for any claim lies squarely on the person who makes the claim. It is not up to you or me to prove the person wrong. It is up to the person who makes the claim to show that they are right. What's the definition of right? Well, I don't know. In your mind, does that require science? And if we pretend to uh, just do what we think is best without proof, well, that certainly does not warrant the claim of being a learned calling or a scientific endeavor. Publishing and refereed literature, that should be our gold standard. I'm fine with people saying it's their opinion, but let's not state opinions as though they're facts.